Now that we've got some experience with quadratic residues, we can start to look for some patterns. Here's a chart containing the quadratic residues modulo 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and 19. There are a lot of places to look for patterns among these values. A surprising pattern arises when we count the pairs of consecutive quadratic residues. If we imagine that quadratic residues and non-residues are essentially random, we would conclude that about a fourth of the time we would get consecutive residues. This is pretty close, and it turns out that we can get an exact formula. Theorem. We have an explicit formula for n of p, where n of p denotes the number of pairs of consecutive quadratic residues modulo p in the interval from 1 to p minus 1. We will save the proof of this theorem for class. This video will be spent up building up the machinery that we'll need. These results are interesting on their own, as sums of this type have applications in other problems. The first theorem we'll prove is basically obvious once you understand what it says. Theorem. Suppose cj is defined for all integers j, and cj equals ck whenever j is congruent to k modulo n. Let r1, r2 up to rn be any complete residue system modulo n. Then this formula must be true. This is just a fancy way of saying that under the right conditions, we can substitute the terms in a sum with representatives from any complete residue system. Notice that the set from 0 to n minus 1 and the set of r sub i are both complete residue systems. That means there is a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence between the two sets, depending on the residue modulo n. Since cj is equal to ck whenever j is congruent to k modulo n, we can see that the two sums have the exact same summands. Because of this, we have an alternate presentation of the summation notation that will help us to stay organized for the calculations that are coming up. We can read this as a sum over all residues modulo n. The theorem that we just proved shows that it doesn't matter which complete residue system we use as long as the cj satisfy the given property. Theorem. If p is an odd prime, then this formula holds. The value of this theorem is that it gives us access to working with sums of products of Legendre symbols. It may seem like a strange sum to consider, but we'll see that it rises somewhat naturally in the proof of the theorem to come. The proof of this theorem is actually an exercise in fancy bookkeeping, but it highlights some of the standard techniques that are used in these types of calculations. We start off by observing that we can write the sum using the notation we just introduced. Notice that as n runs through all the values in a complete residue system, that n plus a must run through all the values as well. This means that we can substitute n plus a for n without changing the sum at all. This form will be easier for us to work with. If a is congruent to b modulo p, then we can compute the sum directly. So suppose that a is not congruent to b modulo p. To simplify the notation, let lambda equal a minus b. Notice that when n is congruent to 0 modulo p, that the Legendre symbol is 0, and so we can pull that term out of the sum. Now that we are working with terms where n is not congruent to 0 modulo p, for each value of n in the sum, there exists an n prime such that n times n prime is congruent to 1 modulo p. Also, n prime squared on p is equal to 1, so we can multiply each of the semands by this without changing the value and rewrite the terms once again. Notice that as n runs through all the non-zero values in a reduced residue system, n prime must also run through all the non-zero values. And since lambda is not congruent to zero modulo p, n prime times lambda must run through all the non-zero values as well. We will let m equal n prime lambda for notational clarity. We will now reinsert the m congruent to zero modulo p term into the sum. But notice that this creates an extra non-zero term, so we'll need to subtract that off. The first term is simply the sum of all the Legendre symbols modulo p. Since there are an equal number of quadratic residues as quadratic non-residues, these terms will all cancel out. Also, 1 on p is equal to 1, and this gets us to the desired conclusion. This proof is another very technical number theory proof. It takes a lot of experience before working with these sums feels natural. For now, the goal is that you would be able to follow along with all the substitutions and manipulations. You may want to go through the string of equations and see how many of the steps you actually feel comfortable explaining yourself to get a sense of how well you follow along. This theorem is actually more general than what we need for the proof coming up in class, but proving the general statement is just as difficult as proving the special case. Also, it's hard at this point to really appreciate how surprising and powerful a result this is. These types of sums have important applications to higher levels of number theory. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future.